So today we are going to get into application design and development and focus on servlets. Last time we looked at uh, how to connect to a database using JDBC. Today's lab is on building web apps using servlets. And so let's cover the basics of this. Now again, I'll skip a lot of slides here and focus on just the relevant stuff. So this is a typical architecture of web applications today. This or a small variant which is coming up in the next slide. You have a browser talking HTTP and connecting to a web server which in turn redirects the request to an application server which in turn talks to a database server which in turn talks to the underlying storage system. The underlying storage system these days may be disk, it may be uh, disk on a separate box which is uh, network attached storage or storage area network. Or more frequently, the web server and the application server are combined into a single unit. And the reason is otherwise there's more overhead of inter-process communication, which is usually unnecessary. So this is what we will be using today. We have a servlet uh, system and uh, the Tomcat uh, system, which can serve both uh, HTTP pages as well as servlets. A quick uh, brush up on HTTP, which influences how uh, web-based applications are built. The first thing to note is that HTTP is What does it say? Connectionless. Actually, it makes a connection and then closes it. It doesn't keep the connections persistent. And the reason for this, uh, there are several reasons. One is uh, operating systems usually put limits on how many network connections you can keep open. If you close a connection, you make it available to others. And the other is that uh, if a server fails, your next request can go to a different server and you know nothing about it. So uh, you don't want to keep connections open for a long time during which servers may change. However, what this means is that if you log in once and authenticate yourself, the connection is lost. So the next time you connect to, a, to the application server, it's like you're a new person. It's a new connection. So how does the application server know who you are? Okay, how many of you are familiar with cookies? Most, but not all. How many of you are familiar with sessions, HTTP sessions? Again, quite a few, but not all. So let me spend a couple of minutes on these two topics. So what happens is your browser has opened a network connection. It's done some stuff. Maybe it logged you in. It took your username, password. You got logged in. But after that, the connection is closed. After a few minutes, the connection is made again. So the first thing is, how does the application server know who you are? And the trick is that it stores a bit of data on your browser, and it can ask for it back. So a cookie is a small piece of data, which the application server can, uh, through HTTP, HTTP is actually two ways. You connect to the application server, but it can make requests back to your browser, and your browser can satisfy that request. So it can request your browser, store this cookie. And when you connect again, it can tell the browser, do you have a cookie with this particular name? What is the name? Usually the URL of that website which you're connecting to. Do you have a cookie with this name? And then some extra uh, identification information. And your browser, if it has that, will give it back to that server. So that cookie usually contains something. One option would be for that cookie to contain your username. Okay, so next time when you log in, your browser will give that username. Is this secure? If the server stores your username, what is the problem? A few people are shaking their head saying it's not secure. The rest are just looking on. How many of you think it is not secure? Raise your hands. Seriously think, not just because I ask. Okay. And you're right, it's not secure because the user can hack the browser. So if I want to pretend to be Fatak, I can 
uh, store a cookie on my browser. I can modify the cookie to replace a Sudarshan by Fatak. And the next time the application server asks for the login, my browser will tell it Fatak and accepts it. I can be Fatak. Okay. Obviously, not a good state of affairs. So, what can you store in the cookie then? You need to store something which cannot be guessed. And if you try random values, you will probably fail most of the time. Okay, so what is stored is some large uh, string. And the string is an identifier. And the application server remembers this identifier. Now, if somebody could tap into the communication between me and the server, they might be able to pull off the identifier if the connection is insecure. If the connection itself is not encrypted, plain HTTP, somebody who is snooping on the wire can pull out my um, the cookie which has been sent to me, and then they can connect to the application server using that cookie. So that is a risk. So to prevent that, today, people, uh, most secure websites use the HTTPS protocol, where everything which goes between the uh, browser and the server is encrypted. Nobody else can tap in and see what it is. And the, how all this is done is a topic for a security course. We won't get into that. But I do want to say a little bit of about application security because we are building applications. So it's usually important that um, you use HTTPS if you're doing something important or if you believe that the network is intrinsically secure. And if you're within an organization, usually the, these days the network is relatively secure if you use a switch network. If somebody can hack into the network, they can tap your packets. But otherwise, a user who plugs in their laptop usually cannot see your traffic. Earlier, it used to be different. The networks used to be hubs, which meant that all the packets that you send will go to everybody on the same Ethernet. And every, anyone can snoop on the packets and easily see what you're doing. Today, it's a little different. Um, it's not so easy to snoop. But if you're going outside of your institute across the public web, who knows what is going on out there? Somebody may be snooping on the wire. You don't know. And if you go to China, you do know. Somebody is snooping. Okay. At least that's what many people claim. That uh, if you go to China, uh, you know, if you want to really be secure, you should take a throwaway laptop, come back and reformat the hard disk. Don't take your real laptop. I don't know if it's true, uh, but that's a reputation they have earned, uh, very uh, richly well-earned reputation for people hacking into things. And you know that they have hacked into our government computers and so on. So these things will happen. So it's, if you're running something important, you better use HTTPS protocol. So coming back, a cookie is a piece of text, which is usually fairly large. So if I uh, try generating random cookies, the chance that it will be a cookie which is currently used by some user is very, very small. Can happen. Everything in life is, to some extent, a chance. Anything can happen. But the chance is fairly small by creating fairly large random strings. Of course, consecutive cookies cannot be related directly to each other. If the server starts giving cookies like one, two, three, I get a cookie five, I can try six, and it probably belongs to somebody. Okay, you can't do that either. So cookie has to be a fairly large random string. OK, so that's how uh, the application server finds out who you are without asking you for the login password each time. So what happens is, the first time when you connect, it will send you a cookie, and it will verify your login password. Then it remembers, this cookie was sent to this browser, and I have checked that that browser has given back that login password, so I know that the user is authenticated. So the application server keeps the connection between the cookie and the user. So next time when it gets that cookie, it knows this is that user. OK, so now this is the basic protocol. But what is the software which implements this protocol? One end of that software is your browser. What about the other end? What software runs there? And here there are many, many alternatives. The first alternative is a simple web server. And again, there are many web servers. Apache is widely used in Microsoft land. IIS is also used. Uh, so these are web servers primarily. Now, 
how do web servers run applications? In the olden days, you would, in the very, very initial days, when you send an application to a web server, it could execute a program. At that point, it executes a program which does something and gives a result back, which it then returns to you. Now, this is a very inefficient way of doing it. How many of you have uh, written gate and tried to get your score on the day of announcement and found that the server crashes? Any of you? How many of you know students who have done this? This is actually very embarrassing. For many years, our gate servers used to crash because they use exactly this architecture. They had a web server which would launch a new process for every single request. And to make things worse, this was written by people who are not database people. And that process would uh, run a grep on a file and search sequentially through a file and show you the result if, it, if your roll number is there or say not found. That is a terrible way of doing things. So you really don't want to launch a process per request. So the way it is handled these days is that uh, the web server or the application server, depending on what you're using, will launch a separate thread to service your request. So if you're using Java, uh, servlets, for example, uh, a thread is launched. At the overhead of launching a thread is very small. The overhead of launching a process is very high. Okay, so the overhead of launching a process on an operating system today uh, is probably of the order of somewhere between 0.1 to 1 millisecond in that ballpark. So per second, you cannot launch more than about, say, 10,000 processes. Uh, but there are, uh, and, and, and then the system is doing nothing but launching processes at that end. Whereas there are, uh, if you do, use threads, the overhead of starting a thread is very small. In fact, there's usually a pool of threads. And in fact, even processes, uh, what Apache does, for example, it has separate processes, uh, but it has a pool of processes. So it doesn't start a new process. It uses one of the existing processes to serve your request. So that's how it gets parallelism. PostgreSQL does the same thing. It doesn't use threads. Uh, there are other databases which use threads, but PostgreSQL has a set of processes, and each request which comes in is sent to an idle process. If there's no idle process, your request is queued up, and when that process processes a request, it sends you a result back. So this is the common architecture. Now, what about the gate application? Why couldn't it have a process to do it? But today you can do that if you use a different kind of interface. So many of you would know about PHP. Right? So how does PHP run? Uh, if again you launch a separate process per PHP request, the overhead is going to be high. But there are PHP modules available for web servers, which means you can run it in the web server. OK. So that's uh, the generic approach. And let's uh, focus on the uh, servlet approach. The servlet is an API, basically, in Java. Again, you could code your own from scratch. But the benefit of a standard API is it does many things for you. For example, this business of creating cookies, uh, sending it to the browser, getting it back, all that is done by the API. You don't need to know how it's done. You can just use APIs for everything. So here is a piece of. Uh, servlet code. As in the JDBC example before, this is uh, just the scaffolding. The actual work is shown in the next slide. So servlet, so defined by creating a class. Here there's a, uh, before that you have to import um, a bunch of stuff, Java IO for file IO, servlet dot star, uh, Java X servlet HTTP star. So you can access various parts of the API in your Java program. And then you define a class. Uh, in this case, you've called it person query servlet, which extends HTTP servlet. So it's a subclass of HTTP servlet class, which means there are certain methods of the HTTP servlet class which it inherits. It can override those methods or leave some of them as default. So in this case, it, uh, this class is implementing a method called do get. So what is the do get method doing? It has two parameters. One is a HTTP servlet request. That parameter encapsulates everything to do with the request that has come in. And the second parameter is the HTTP uh, servlet response, which encapsulates everything about what you send back to the browser. And these are the two objects which you use for 
getting input and sending results back. And this uh, method throws two possible exceptions, servlet exception and IO exception. So any method which calls this, in, in, in this case, the, who calls this? You are not going to write any code to call this. The uh, server, the, the application server which you're using, you'll be using Tomcat. It is going to call this do get method on a particular class. So you have to do a little bit more work to tell Tomcat, if you get a request with this particular URL, send it to this particular, or call this particular uh, servlet class, which I have defined here. So that you can do manually, or if you use Eclipse, uh, that may be auto-generated for you. So in the instructions which you have, that mapping is created uh, behind the scenes for you, but you can also edit it and create your own mapping. So now what does it do? The first line there, it says response.setContentType text HTML. Why is this important? Because when you make a, a request on the web, you may get different kinds of data back. And the HTTP protocol has a way for the browser to find out what is coming back. So in this case, you are telling, uh, you are, by, by doing response.setContentType to text HTML, that's a standard type, you are telling the system, tell the browser that the type is HTML. And it will process it as HTML. It could also be binary data, there's an octet uh, stream, uh, it could, which, you could use for various things. You could say uh, JPEG, so that it's a picture which is interpreted as JPEG. So there are many types, standard types. So you can define the type here. And then the data which you put into the uh, response should match that type. Otherwise the browser will get into trouble. So that is the first thing. Next, you're saying print writer out equal to response dot get writer. So this is a class. Uh, an object in this case of type uh, of class print writer, which you can use to do print into that. So now I'm doing the following out dot print line head title query result slash title slash head. So what is this? This is standard HTTP, uh, which says this is the uh, head of the page and the title is query result. Then it says out dot print line body. It says what follows is the body. And then there's a bunch of code which is on the next slide. And then you say out.println slash body. So in HTTP, every tag has to be ended by a corresponding slash of the same name. So it has to be properly nested. If it's not properly nested, what can happen? Well, browsers do their best to manage if HTTP uh, syntax is messed up. But how they manage may be browser dependent. So you may have code which works fine on browser A but dies on browser B because there was a syntax error in there. And there are tools to detect these syntax errors, um, but you should be careful to match these tags and so forth. And then out.close to say we are done. So that's the body of a servlet. Now the actual content inside, it should do something useful. So in our example servlet, what it's doing is, it's uh, this particular piece of code is used to find students with a specified name. So how do you, um, well, uh, it could be, th this is part of a larger program. So we have that example thing in the book. So what it's doing here is you can specify that you want to search for students or instructors and give a name. If you say student, the name is only search in students. If you say instructor, the name is searched only in the instructor relation. So that's the logic that we want. So the browser, in the browser, the user is selecting a drop-down box which is either student or uh, instructor, and then entering text for a name in another box. So how is that done? Uh, how is that use accessed here, rather? And then the user is clicking on a submit button. So the, I, I'm not going over the HTTP form. Uh, that is something which you need to also deal with. Okay, so you have to create HTTP forms. Uh, there is a sample form. You can modify that uh, for simplicity, if you're not familiar with it. So now, um, in the servlet body, I can access these parameters by name. So if you see the first line there, it says string person type equal to request dot get parameter string person type. So in the form I had said person type, uh, it's a drop down, student or instructor. That value which you chose in the drop down box is retrieved here. 
The next line is request.get parameter name. So this is the name which you typed in. So now the system checks if person type dot equals student. In Java, you can't say directly equals. You have to say dot equals here. Uh, if it e dot equals student, now I need to look up student. I have not shown the actual JDBC code here, uh, but that has to be filled in. Now don't forget, when you fill in the JDBC code, that code will take a parameter which is student, uh, the name rather. Now don't forget, you should never concatenate parameters which you got over HTTP to create a query string. Never ever do that. It's a huge security hole. Use a prepared statement with a question mark placeholder and then set that particular parameter to the name which you receive. That's the correct way of doing it. Okay, so now use JDBC and you've got a result set back, let's say. Now you have to format the output. So in this case, there may be multiple students with the same name, so we are creating a table. So here, um, out dot print line table, border, you want to show a border, calls equal to three, three columns. And what are we printing now? For each line, so this one is just the header. Uh, TR is table row start, TD is data for one cell, and that data is your ID. The next cell is name, and the last cell is department. And each of these is closed at the appropriate point. So that is the header of the table. Now we loop over the result set. We retrieve ID name and department name into these variables, let's say. And then we say out dot print line, this is more or less the same, except here ID was within this string. Whereas here, I'm printing TRTD and then plus ID. So I'm printing the name which was retrieved and so forth till the last one. And finally, out dot print line slash table. So this is what is printed out. Okay, now there is a slight issue here when I just print out text like this. Supposing somebody's name contained uh, angular bracket B close angular bracket or something like that. What would be printed? What would be shown on the browser? The browser would treat that as a as, play, as a HTML command. Okay, the problem is what is being sent out here is HTML. It's not plain text. And things which begin with angular bracket are treated as commands. And then the name will get messed up. So uh, if you, uh, uh, for example, uh, print out a SQL program with less than, the less than may be interpreted as a HTML command. Okay. So th there are uh, libraries which will escape these characters and print it out. So you can use those uh, to get it done right. We have not done it here. And finally, uh, print the uh, slash table to close the table. And that is the part for student. There's another part not shown for instructor. And so that's the main uh, logic inside this thing. Very simple. Any questions at this point about the protocol or the syntax? Okay. Then I mentioned uh, this business of identifying users. In, uh, yeah, your question. Sir, uh, I just want to know how do how uh, do we differentiate that web server and application server? How do we differentiate? Uh, what is the difference? The in border is fuzzy. Uh, so something which is designed primarily to serve plain web pages would be a web server, something which was designed primarily to um, run programs uh, in servlets or other such things would be an application server. But the boundary is very fuzzy these days. Like I said, uh, many things will mix the two functionalities. Apache has modules which can run many things in the web server itself. So now Apache is uh, HTTPD, you could say is an application uh, server in that sense. Tomcat can serve HTML pages. So Tomcat is also a web server in this sense. This is the original uh, design uh, goal was pure web server versus pure application server. And it reflects in the set of features that they provide. But otherwise, the boundary is not uh, very sharp. It's fuzzy. Sir, yeah. if we develop the applications in web in the .NET, that is more powerful than the servlets in Java. If you develop applications in what? Web .NET. applications in .NET. Yes, it's .NET. more powerful than Java. Mm. Uh, I, what do you mean by powerful? So you can do exactly the same things in both. 
The question is convenience. How many lines of code do you have to write to get a particular job done? And servlets are actually a little bit of a pain because you have to write a lot of lines of code. If you go back to this uh, example, you had to understand uh, HTML. You had to output raw HTML with a lot of print lines. It's very clumsy looking code. So, for, uh, I mean, there are other tools available, of course. So, in the servlet world itself, there is something called JSP, which allows you to flip the thing. You write HTML code. In fact, you don't necessarily have to write it by hand. There are uh, tools which help you create HTML using a GUI. So you don't need to know HTML. It can generate the HTML for you. And then you insert pieces of Java code at suitable points within that. So that is very widely used. Uh, that started with Microsoft application server page, ASP. And then uh, the Java world uh, created JSP, which is a clone of that. Uh, so that is what many people use rather than raw servlets. Um, so I have a slide or so on that later. And some uh, people have already been uh, using that. And uh, you, know, you, can, you can use that for the assignment if you wish. Uh, but my suggestion is for the purpose of this assignment, stick to servlets. And then you can add a JSP if you wish. And for the purpose of the project, uh, you're most welcome to run it using JSP. We, we use JSP a lot in IIT. It's pretty convenient. It's a lot easier than um, servlets. But ultimately, even JSP pages are compiled to servlets. Now, that's not the only thing. There are many other tools. Even with JSP, there's a lot of overhead to doing simple stuff. Uh, so there are many tools. Uh, so in the .NET world, Visual Studio does offer um, fairly easy ways of creating not just the HTML, but also the stuff that goes into it. For example, this tables and so on. You don't have to code that raw. You don't have to know HTML to create a table and put stuff in there. So there are objects which you can use. You can fill them in and it will create a table. In fact, not only does it create a table, it creates a table which allows you to interact with the table. How do you interact? You can sort. Click on a column, it will sort on that column. Okay? So, there are many more such uh, features which are provided by specific things which you can use. Uh, so now that in the .NET world, that comes packaged with .NET. In the Java world, you can do some of these through JavaScript libraries. So there are a lot of JavaScript libraries. Uh, YUI is one popular one. jQuery is another very popular one. Uh, so YUI is from Yahoo. jQuery, I think, came from Google, I think. So these are very popular tools, and you can use those. Yeah, so in the web 2.0 world, uh, there's a lot of interest. I'll come back to JavaScript later on. Yeah. Excuse me, sir. Mari. So my question is, uh, what is the comparison between CGI, that is common gateway interface, as well as servlets? Yeah. So CGI is what I, I didn't mention the name, but when I told you the old gate application would launch a process per request, that is using the CGI interface. That interface is very inefficient, and nobody uses it unless they don't know what they are doing. Okay, so uh, that that's not a good way of doing things. There are more questions, sir. So when we are uh, logged in into that uh, a Gmail type of things, it's asking us to if you, if you want to store that username password uh, automatically like that. Yeah. Whether is it a, a kind of cookies where it will be stored either both the location or only in that local location? Okay. That's a good question. Uh, so many systems offer to remember your name, right? Or remember your login for some period. How do they do that? They are using cookies. There are uh, basically uh, cookies are stored in the browser's uh, private file system area. So you can view it if, if you uh, go to your browser. There is a way to view what all cookies are stored in the browser. And then you can even, uh, so what it can do is, it can store a cookie which identifies you, a session, on this side. And on their side, they will have a corresponding persistent store for that cookie. So that even if you come back after one day, and even if they have uh, rebooted their system in between, uh, they will remember the cookie which they sent you. And if you, uh, if you if, 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 when they ask you for a cookie, if you give that cookie back, it will look it up and say, ah, I know who this person is. So that's how they remember you across sessions. You may close your browser, shut down your machine, come back up, but the cookie is stored in the file. So the uh, browser is fetching it from a file. 
And on their side, similarly, the cookie is stored in persistent storage, maybe a database or something. So important question often I'm facing when I'm working with my uh, institution environment. Often it's asking about that confirm the certification for each, whenever I'm visiting some websites, mm. it's, it's uh, pro prompting some uh, uh, security issues. Just confirm this particular certification, whether you're accepting this certificate or not like that. Okay. What is that actually? I'm not getting it. Okay. So uh, this is to do with the HTTPS, the secure HTTP protocol. Um, let me give you a high level view of what is going on. So. There are several issues here in security. First of all, when I am connecting to a website and talking with it, how do I know that I am connecting to that website? Okay, so I am connecting to Google. How do I know the other side is Google? So somebody who has hacked the network can say, if I get requests for google.com, route that to some other machine. And that machine can accept my username password. Now it has my username password. Now, of course, uh, it first has to convince me it is Google. How does it do that? It serves the, exactly the same page. It goes to Google, gets a copy of their login page, and serves me that login page. And I don't even know I have gone to something else because I typed www.google.com, and at the network layer, somebody hacked it and rerouted it. So I have no idea I have gone to some other site. As far as I know, I went to Google. I'm clueless, but somebody else has captured my login and my password. Okay. So. That's a serious problem. And this was recognized very early in the web. And the solution for it was a, a digital certificate. So I won't get into the details of how it is done. But it's essentially, uh, think of it as uh, somebody else signing this thing, saying that this site is google.com. Now, the hacker cannot get that certificate original. Uh, they, there's a private key associated with it, which is stored at the Google servers. The hacker cannot get at that. He can get at your network and reroute it, uh, but he cannot get that. Now, what HTTPS protocol does is it asks for the certificate from that site, and there's extra stuff going on, which uh, uh, what it does is it gets a, what is called a public key of the site. So I don't know the public key of google.com. My browser doesn't know, uh, but I know the public key. It's pre-stored of some. Uh, certifying authorities like VeriSign. So there are a number of certifying authorities. The keys for those are stored in the browser. When you download the browser, it's already there. And now using those keys, it can verify the signature of the certificate and check that uh, this certificate was issued to Google and this is the public key of Google. Now what do I do with the public key? Now there's an extra protocol using this public key to make sure that the other side server actually has the corresponding private key. This comes in pairs, public private key. Uh, the private key is known only to Google. It will not reveal it to anybody else. And the public key is made available to me. And I know that this is Google's public key. Otherwise, that website who hacked in can give me a public key and say, this is Google's public key, and fool me. But because I've got a signed certificate with a signature I know, I know that this is Google's public key. And we proceed uh, to establish a connection. So all this is part of HTTPS. But the key is that the site should give a certificate back, which is signed by somebody that I trust. Now, uh, for the purpose of testing and so on, you can self-certify your own certificates. So many sites uh, say, we have done HTTPS, but they will give you a self-signed certificate. And then the, uh, when you access it, uh, your browser will say, I don't recognize this signature. Uh, do you want to go ahead? Do you trust this site or don't trust it? Unfortunately, even IIT does this in many cases. They have not bothered to get a properly signed certificate from a certifying It's not hard to do it, but people have been lazy, even in IIT Bombay. And then we have to say, OK, accept the exception. So that's probably what you saw. Uh, but if somebody hacks in, I won't know now. They can also give a certificate and fool me. I, I have no idea. So that is the risk. Now, this certificate thing is gives a lot of prediction, but it's not ultimate. In fact, um, People have hacked into the certifying authorities and generated certificates for themselves. Somebody generated certificates for Google and proceeded to use it to lure people to some other site. They thought it was Google. They revealed the passwords. So uh, security is never 100%. So there is a guardian, but if the guardian is hacked into and somebody gets at it, then you're in trouble.
Last question, sir. Yeah. Is regarding with that uh, extend as well as listener, there are two key words in that uh, Java, isn't it? Extends as well as listener and like that. What is the difference between these two things? Sorry? What, what extend the... on keyboard we are using. Extend. Extend. That, uh, is this previous slide, I saw that extends something else. Here. Uh, so first, extends. Extends is Java syntax for saying that this is a subclass of uh, the other class. So this class is a subclass of HTTP servlet. Therefore, it inherits some methods. It also inherits some method definitions which it has to implement. So do get is implemented. It, it actually overrides the thing which is already implemented in the parent. There are also other things, do post and uh, several others which are in there. Um, so that is extends. It's a subclass. Now what is the other one? Listener? Listener. Listeners. Listener, uh, that is not uh, related to this. I think you, you're talking of the Oracle listener in this, Java, implements. OK, I'm not sure. So I already told you about sessions. I started on this. So you don't have to worry about cookies. What you do in the servlet code is you just do the following. You say request dot get session false. It tells you if a session has been set up already. Now this session setup is not actually authenticating anybody. It is just setting up a session. So all that checks is did this browser connect to me recently? And the session has a timeout after some time the session is forgotten. So what this is checking is did the browser connect to me in the last 20, few minutes? And that default you can set. If it is true, then it is an existing session, and you can look up information which was stored about the session. If it is false, that means um, the session is a new one. Somebody new has come. I have not seen this person before. And this other part, false here, what is that saying? It is saying, if the session was not there, don't create a session. If I say true, what it will do is, it will say, no, it's a new session, but it also creates a session automatically. Okay? So that session is not identifying anyone. It is setting a cookie. It's generating a cookie and sending it. So I don't know who this browser is, but I recognize this particular browser. I don't know who is behind the browser. Okay? So if somebody else comes, I know it is not this browser. But it's still anonymous. If I want to know who it is, I have to take a login password and then do something more. So in this case, uh, if it is uh, true, it's an existing session. Otherwise, redirect to an authentication page. What does the authentication page do? It accepts a login and a name and a password. It checks if the password matches that login. And if so, it does request.get session true. What does that do? It creates a new session at that point. We came in here because there wasn't a session. Now it creates a new session. So now, when you see that a session is active, uh, you can look up this thing. Uh, so, well, before that, once you authenticate it, you want to remember this user. In the insecure code which I told you, you set a cookie with the username. But that cookie is sent to the browser which is insecure. Here, you do something slightly different. Instead of doing it in a browser end, you're doing session dot set attribute the string user ID and the user ID which you got here, right? login, password, whatever that was. So this is set in the session. Now this session information is never sent to the browser. It is stored locally at the application server. And it is identified ultimately by the session. And that session is a cookie which is going back and forth with the browser. You don't have to worry about that detail. Once you set this, so this session.set attribute will happen here after checking the login password. Uh, so first you say request.get session true, create a session. Immediately after that you will say session.set attribute user ID with that login. Now here, if request.get session false equal to true, that means it is an existing session. You will say session.get attribute user ID. You should do that. That's the way you know who that session was after logging in. Now, a common security mistake is 
people create new servlets and forget to check this. This check has to be done in every servlet that you use. If you forget to do it, somebody can access that servlet and get in without actually having logged in. So that is a security hole. In fact, it's unfortunately all too common a hole because programmers tend to be forgetful. Um, so what happens then? Somebody who knows the URL of this thing. So most users will go to the main website and get the login page, type in login password and get in. A clever hacker will uh, uh, go to a page which is not checking the user ID and provide parameters of their choice and then have them executed. Now the, most of these things will at least have a session check. So there is a session. So the trick is they first log in as themselves and then they go to a page which forgets, which has forgotten to check for the user ID and give some other user ID and do what they want. Now this happened some years ago. There was a, a US website which was used for university applications. Uh, it's a very poorly designed website which unfortunately is still used by many universities. Uh, so what that website did is they goofed up and they made two mistakes. The first mistake was uh, they were supposed to declare results on a certain date, but they had another uh, web page which was not public, which was showing the results for testing purposes ahead of the declaration date. And that URL, that's, uh, I don't know if they use servlets, whatever technology they, they used, they forgot to check for user ID. So what some clever students found is that they could log in and then go to that URL, somehow that leaked out. They could go to the URL and find out whether they had been accepted by a university or not. Okay. They couldn't actually do much more. They could only find out if they had been accepted. They couldn't even see what others had done. Uh, but they were not supposed to know until a particular date. Okay. Because uh, may, maybe universities reserved the right to change it till that date. They may mark it temporarily as accept. I don't know what the reason it was. And then th this was found out. And unfortunately for them, there was a log of who had accessed that page. And they had logged in as themselves. So now the website, after uh, screwing up in step one, very efficiently identified who all had done this. And very sadly for those people, uh, the universities involved said that you guys are hacking, we withdraw your admission. Okay? So it was quite unfortunate for those users. I, I, you know, most of them probably knew they were doing something slightly shady, but none of them thought it was such a big deal because they were just seeing the results a few days ahead of time. But anyway, they lost their admission. So the point is that it's easy to forget it and it can have real world repercussions. In a previous slide, we are writing uh, request.get session in bracket false. We are passing false to that method. Why? Yeah. So that is an indication to the method. If you say false, it will not create a session. If you say true, if a session exists, it returns it. If it doesn't exist, it creates a new session. So what does it mean to create a session? It talks HTTP with your browser and creates a cookie and sets the cookie. So that next time, if it asks, so what happened first time you, you said um, request.get session false. What happened is at that point, the uh, application server code went and talked to the browser and said, give me a cookie with this name. And at, what had happened is the browser said, I don't have that cookie, sorry. And then this uh, returned false. Request.get session returned the value false and therefore you went to the else case. Now when you do request.get session true, the session didn't exist, it will again ask the browser and the browser says, no, I don't have that cookie. But at this point, because of this true here, the application server creates a new cookie and tells it now save this cookie value. That's what happens. Uh, so we are doing session dot uh, set attribute yeah. uh, user ID. Yeah. So in that case, this user ID will be stored uh, at client side only or as well at server side? It's stored only at the server. The user ID is not stored at the client. If you s store at it at the browser, server. it can be hacked. So it is not stored at the browser. It's stored okay. only at the uh, app server. Okay, app, app, uh, web server will store yeah. this session ID. Yeah. The only thing that is stored at the browser is some other cookie, which is some large random string. Okay, so now uh, how do you run your servlet code? There are many uh, pieces of software which you can use. Tomcat was one of the early ones, uh, and you will be using Tomcat. 
but there are many other uh, things which also run servlets. Uh, Glassfish, JBoss are both widely used. And there are many others. Now, you are going to be using Eclipse. Uh, you have used Eclipse already yesterday. Um, Eclipse does not have a server built in. So you have to in interface Eclipse with Tomcat so that when you click on something in Eclipse, it actually um, starts running Tomcat and uh, puts your uh, servlet code in the Tomcat directory so Tomcat can access it. All this is done transparently by Eclipse. After you configure Eclipse to use a particular instance of Tomcat. There may be many Tomcats on your computer. You have to tell Eclipse which Tomcat to use. Now the problem is uh, there is a Tomcat which runs by default and Eclipse will grab that Tomcat if, if there is a, such a Tomcat on your system. And the problem is that Tomcat is running as a separate user. You don't have access to it. And therefore, you need to create your own copy of Tomcat, which you will run. And there are instructions for that. And the second thing is, Tomcat runs on a particular port. It listens on a particular port by default. And if, uh, so the port is 8080. That's why you send requests. Now, if your system already has a Tomcat running by default, depends on how it was set up. Uh, so your desktop machine usually don't have Tomcat running by default. So it's you can use all the default Tomcat settings. But if you're using a, a machine which already has Tomcat running, and you want to use Tomcat to test out your application, you have to edit the Tomcat configuration file to use a different port number. Okay, I don't think our instructions include all that. We have assumed that Tomcat is not running, uh, which is typically the case. Our desktops don't have Tomcat running. Your laptops probably don't have Tomcat running. Uh, but in case it's already running, Beware that you have to go edit the Tomcat files and change the port number. The second thing is um, Eclipse and Tomcat can talk to each other. And Eclipse, uh, when you tell it use this Tomcat, Eclipse knows which port. Uh, but if you want to directly tom to Tomcat, you have to give the port number. OK. So now uh, let's quickly brush over a few more uh, topics I'm not going to go into detail. The first is server-side scripting. And we already mentioned JSP, Java server pages. Uh, this flips the regular servlets. In regular servlets, Java code is the main, and then you have print line for all the HTML code. Here, HTML code is main, and then in Angular bracket, percent, percent Angular bracket. Within that, you embed Java code. And there is a translation system which runs on the fly, which takes this and creates a servlet out of it. And then compiles that servlet and runs it all dynamically. You don't even know it's going on. But it's based on servlets. This is just a layer on top of servlets. So it's easier to do things here. Uh, what is not shown here is um, how does this um, JSP connect to the database? So you need to include uh, some other class which does the database connection and call it from here to get a database connection. And then you can have code here which talks to the database. Or you can just call some other external Java function from within that. And that function can do everything else you want for database connection. And what it returns is, uh, what it does here, by the way, if you see out.println hello world, this gets embedded inside this HTML. So that's how the Java code here and the enclosing HTML interface with each other. So you have to use out.println to generate HTML code, which is embedded inside this enclosing HTML stuff. Uh, so there's a lot of tags which you can use with uh, this. PHP is another very, very widely used thing. Moodle, for example, is built using PHP. Uh, it's Actually, we're pretty easy to write a lot of uh, code in PHP. The overhead is less than with servlets, it's like JSP. Um, so here, you will note this is all HTTP. And then open uh, angular bracket, question mark, PHP. And then question mark, close bracket. That's the delimiter. Everything in between is a PHP script. And 
uh, there are a bunch of uh, predefined things in PHP. For example, dollar underscore request is the uh, equivalent of HTTP request in servlets. And uh, it's treat, treated as an array indexed by the parameter name. It returns the uh, name which was set. And of course, you have to see if it was set. So what this is saying is if not is set request name, then just say echo hello world. Otherwise, echo hello world request name. And now note that echo here is like out dot print line. It, the HTML page generated has all this plus whatever this has echoed. So uh, Apache includes a module to execute PHP in the process itself. So then the PHP is executed and whatever uh, required is done there and then that page is served. So Apache is uh, Tomcat, uh, sorry, not Apache, HTTPD is essentially an application server for PHP. The next thing is client-side scripting. There's a long history for client-side scripting JavaScript is pretty old. Initially, it was used in very limited ways. Today, it's very widely used. All of web 2.0 technology, which you, if all of us use extensively when you go to Gmail, when you go to Facebook, when you go to LinkedIn, when you go to pretty much any website today, you are using um, web 2.0 technology, which at its core requires JavaScript, so that the browser can do stuff more than just send requests, get result back. Which, which was original HTML. Um, I'll skip the details here, but just give a small example of JavaScript. How many of you have used JavaScript? Again, quite a few, but not all. So for those who haven't, uh, you should encourage your students to use JavaScript because today pretty much all applications use JavaScript. But on the other hand, you have to be very careful with JavaScript. If you use JavaScript raw, to interface with uh, HTML in the browser and so forth, what happens is you can uh, create web pages which only run on certain browsers, okay? So this unfortunately happens all too often. There are minor incompatibilities between JavaScript implementations in different browsers. So uh, today if I go to the computer science department web page, unfortunately one part of it was written using some JavaScript library, somebody downloaded from the web. And if I view it from one of Firefox or Chrome, one of the two, there's a drop down menu. The menu appears, but when I try to go and menu item and click, it vanishes. It's like playing a game, it's uh, taunting me. Haha, <laughs> try to click on me. I'll disappear before you can click. Okay. Very irritating. And I've asked the uh, student who is responsible for it to fix it. And he says, uh, sorry, I don't know how to fix it. So when I get time after this course, I will go and bash him up. Um, but as of today, the page doesn't work properly on all browsers. Very frustrating. Okay. So this is an example of how not to use JavaScript. Do not download random JavaScript libraries which somebody has created and use it. Because they probably didn't take care to, that it will work across all browsers. Even worse, don't write your own JavaScript raw. And I'll tell you what I mean by that. Um, then you can guarantee that your JavaScript will only work on the browser you tested it on. It will not work on anything else. The one which was downloaded at least works on two or three browsers, okay, if not on all. So what do you do? The trick is, see, the core JavaScript language is standardized. What is slightly non-standard is uh, some of the interfaces with the browser. So the trick is to use standard JavaScript tools. Uh, so I mentioned this before. YUI is one such thing from Yahoo, and jQuery is another. So these are very popular uh, JavaScript uh, libraries. And if you use these, you call functions that they provide, and that function will actually check which browser are you using and use the appropriate code for that browser. Now, supposing your browser changes and browsers keep updating, these guys do make some effort to, first of all, they, the initial code itself is pretty good. They have taken care that it will work across all browsers. And periodically, they update it in case new browsers become popular. They will make sure it is compatible with the new browser. So you just get a new version of the library and download it 
your application should work fine. Okay, so you don't have to worry about incompatibility. So that's the only way to write JavaScript uh, interfaces. The core programming language is standard, but interfacing with a HTML and browser, never do it raw, always use libraries. Okay, so let's look at what is going on here. This is a JavaScript. This is also HTML. Inside of HTML, it says script space type equal to text slash JavaScript, function validate, blah, blah, blah. So all this is going to be executed by the browser. Now this function validate is saying document dot get element by id credits dot value, blah, blah, blah. It's a bunch of stuff. Um, this code is actually accessing the HTML in the browser. So this document get element credits and so on is part of the HTML of that page. This function is accessing that HTML. And this is what I said you should try to avoid as far as possible. Um, the simplest thing is okay, this is probably okay. But once you get to more complex stuff, it, the exact syntax varies by browser. So you should not do that directly. You can do it, but you're asking for trouble. And then it checks if it is not a number or if credits less than zero or greater than 16, it puts an alert saying credits must be a number greater than zero, less than 16, return false. What is that doing? When the function is called, it checks if you've entered a reasonable credits. If not, it pops up a box saying, sorry, error. And then you have to click OK to make the box go away. And then what hap when is this function called? It's called here. Form blah, blah, blah. Input type equal to uh, submit, value equal to submit. That's the submit button. In the form, it says action equal to create course. So this is a servlet maybe, which create course. And it says on submit, return validate. So what this is doing is it is calling this function. And if the function returns false, it never goes back to the application. Right at the browser, it short circuits it and cancels your request. This is very useful. This is, you find this in many, many places. Some validity checks are done before you go to the back end. Makes life easier for you. And if validate returns true, which is the default, if it runs out here, it returns true, then the submit goes ahead and submits it to the application server. Is this clear? So that's quick key on JavaScript. I'm going to skip some details here, some buzzwords, object relational mapping. How many of you have heard of this buzzword? Anyone? How many of you have heard of hibernate? I don't, well, there are many meanings for hibernate. Uh, I'm sure most of you uh, have seen the Windows uh, sleep hibernate shutdown options. I don't mean that hibernate. <laughs> Uh, I, and I don't mean the bears hibernating either. <laughs> I mean the hibernate object relational uh, system. How many of you are familiar with the hibernate object relational system? Anyone? One, two, whatever, few, very, almost no one. So what is object relational mapping? So when you build a Java application, you can write SQL to get data from the database and then process it. It's a lot of work to get to write SQL and get at it. So for a long time, people have been attempting to provide a way where in Java, you can write a function which says, uh, you know, get student given a primary key, student dot name, student dot address, and you get a student object. You don't need to write SQL. Underneath, you have to have some way of telling the system when somebody says, uh, get student with a primary key, you actually have to go to the database, get a student record using that value as the primary key, fetch it, and create a Java object out of it. What does the Java object contain? For every attribute of the student record, it will have a corresponding method, like get name, or get address, whatever and maybe set name, set address, if you want to allow updates to go back also. So what it's doing is, it is mapping relational tuples to Java objects. And there are two steps in using Hibernate. 
The first step is the mapping step. That's why this is called object relational mapping. You first create the mapping step. Somebody has to tell the system, this is the S uh, table in SQL, and this is the corresponding Java object, and here is how I map attributes in the uh, relation to fields of the object. And this mapping can be reasonably complex. It need not be direct one to one. Uh, I can create an object student which has a method which is the courses, which will return a set of courses that the student took. So this mapping is taking the student row and the takes relation and combining it to get a Java object. So you can even specify such things, but we won't get into that. The bottom line is you specify this mapping, and then the programmer simply says uh, student.get with the roll number, and then print student.name, print address, whatever. It's a lot easier to write this than to write the SQL query. So it's become very popular. There are actually two reasons for its popularity. A, it's easier to write. B, how to generate that SQL? Okay. You have to write SQL for Oracle. You have to, if you switch your database to Postgres, the syntax changes a little bit. You have to go rewrite all that for Postgres. Hibernate uh, and other object relation ORM systems, what they do is, they will take care of these details for you. They will uh, generate appropriate SQL for that database to fetch that particular student record. So it's very easy now if you build a system with Hibernate. Hibernate is open source, uh, so it's free. If you build a system with Hibernate, you can retarget it at a very short notice from Oracle to PostgreSQL. Uh, why do people like this? Because it gives them bargaining power. Okay, so um, NSDL, uh, which uh, does several things, the National Securities Depository, uh, it also manages a lot of your tax information. I'm sure many of you have used the tin.nsdl chalan. How many of you have used it? Okay, so NSDL does a lot of these things. So they were building a new system, and uh, Professor Fartak was their consultant on what technologies to use. So he told them, you know, you probably will end up using Oracle as a backend, but don't tie yourself to Oracle. Use Hibernate. So they could build the whole system using Hibernate, and when they actually had to negotiate uh, to get a database, they could play Oracle versus IBM versus PostgreSQL even if they wanted. I mean, it, it didn't have some features they needed, but they could tell these vendors, look, our system is written in Hibernate. You give us a good price, otherwise we will go to this other guy. So what have you achieved? You avoided vendor lock-in. If you have vendor lock-in, you pay whatever price the vendor says. You can do nothing. If the vendor says five crores, you pay five crores, or you're stuck. They didn't, so the point of ORM is they're no longer stuck. They could get a good price. And they were really happy with Professor Fartak for advising them to do this, because they saved a lot of money later on when they were negotiating. So that's one of the non-technical reasons ORMs have become very popular. It avoids lock-in. Any questions on this? There are drawbacks also of ORM. In particular, if you want to write complex queries, it's not easy. You know, it's great for fetching a record, updating a record, but it's not good for complex queries. They have defined their own query language and so on, um, but uh, people prefer to code directly in standard SQL rather than use Hibernate's query language. And of course, once you do that, you are logged into whichever SQL you are using. But what is important is the number of such complex queries is small. Usually an application has a lot of code which uses very simple SQL queries and a little bit of code for reports which use complex queries. So that part alone they would have to rewrite if they move from Oracle to DB2. Uh, the other parts are in Hibernate, it's a lot easier. Okay, any questions? Somebody with a mic, yeah, go ahead. Sir, uh, is it the Hibernate and EZB are the same technologies? Because in uh, EJB also, uh, same kind of things are happening. EJB? Uh, EJB, Enterprise Job. Yeah. So as I said, there have been many attempts in the past to uh, do this mapping and hide the details. EJB was certainly one of the earlier attempts, uh, but it didn't take off that much. Hibernate, on the other hand, has been very popular. 
so why did Hibernate take off and EJB didn't take off? Um, I think, I, I'm not sure uh, exactly. I think there are some technical differences which uh, created problems for EJB, whereas Hibernate could do it. Uh, in fact, uh, this has been a very long standing thing. This dates back to the 1980s at least. Since then, people have been trying to build these systems which provide an object view of data in a database. Uh, there have been many attempts which um, most of them failed. They were all commercial companies which, you know, so people don't use them because it's a lock-in to that commercial company. What Hibernate's selling point is that it's open source, you're not logged in, you don't pay us anything, and you avoid lock-in to a vendor. So I think the economic case was very strong for Hibernate. EJB also had that, but I don't know why it didn't take off. Sir. Yeah. Sir, a stored procedure we can also use in database queries. Mm -hmm. And here the object session we are also using as object relational model. Is there any kind of correlation or is these are completely different? Yeah, so it's different. So stored procedures are code which runs in the database. And this is stuff which is running in the application. The application is uh, talking plain SQL to the database. Now, stored procedures actually, uh, they're useful in one way because you can do work in the database without back and forth to the application. Um, but from the viewpoint of lock-in, they're very bad because no two databases have the same stored procedure language. If you write it for Oracle, it'll work only on Oracle. It will not run on PostgreSQL and vice versa. Uh, so you get a lock-in if you use that. So many people avoid it. It's very useful, but people avoid it simply for economic reasons of avoiding lock-in. But if you're doing it with PostgreSQL and you know, it's not an economic reason, you, you could use their stored procedure language. But again, if you want to migrate from PostgreSQL to some other database for scalability or you know, whatever other reasons, uh, then you're locked in. Okay, so let's move on to that. Um, so there's some slides on Hibernate. I'll, I'll not go into details. There's also an entity data model which Microsoft has been pushing for some years. Not been very successful, but it has similar goals. There's some slides on uh, performance of uh, web servers. Again, I, I'll cover it in the main workshop. I won't do it now. And then there are some slides on security. SQL injection I already covered, uh, but the, it's again repeated here to make sure that it's driven home because it's so important. But also here, I want to mention one other kind of application level security issue called cross-site scripting. So what happens in cross-site scripting? So what is the model for your browser identifying who you are to a, to a particular website? Okay. What happens is uh, a request is sent from your browser to a website, it does something. If I connect to, the, to my bank, I log in and do something. My, uh, when I click on a submit button somewhere, there is a HTTP request being sent to the bank's website saying, do this action. Okay. Now, normally you would think that this would only happen when I click on a submit button on the bank's web page. Okay. It happens with my knowledge, you would think. Not true. Supposing you did the following. Okay. Um, I go to some shady uh, website and that website has the following code. Image source equal to HTTP colon slash slash mybank.com transfer money question mark amount equal to 1000 to account equal to something. Okay, so let's say that the, um, uh, your bank's web page had a transfer money link. When you filled in the amount and the account number, click submit, this is what it does. Let's suppose. Okay. Um, now, you go to this website. You never clicked on any such bank link, but you're logged into the bank. That's a prerequisite. You logged into the bank. You didn't log out. In between, you went to another website. Now, that website had this piece of text in there, image source equal to. Now, why image source equal to? Because the uh, browsers today allow you to fetch image from. Uh, so when you go to a site, like foo.com, it can say, fetch this image from somewhere else. That's needed for many applications to run properly. So the browser cannot say, I will only fetch images from your website. If I go to website X, if the browser says, I will only allow images from site X, 
many applications will stop working. So browsers don't enforce that. They allow images to be fetched from somewhere else. In this case, the browser has no clue that this is not an image. It doesn't know. So it goes to that thing. Uh, it, it executes that request. And that request now goes ahead and transfers the money. Okay. So what has happened? You visited some site. That site had a script. This, you can think of this as a script, which executed a, a request on some other website. That's why it's called cross-site. And your money was transferred, gone. If, the, uh, if you, uh, tomorrow you go to the bank and say, I, I never did that, the bank will say, here's a log. You were logged in, you did this. You didn't do it really, but it was done on your behalf. It's your fault. The bank will not accept responsibility. Okay, it's your headache, not theirs. Okay, so you understand what has happened. So how to prevent this? Unfortunately, it's a very, very hard problem. If you go to an untrusted website, it can do whatever it wants. So lesson number one is don't go to untrusted websites. Go only to websites which you know are reasonably well maintained, that they won't uh, allow, they won't do such things themselves. And they will also put enough protections that it's hard for hackers to get in and do that. The latter part is very hard. Many websites have been hacked. You go to a government of India site which has been hacked, this might be there. So of course the other way is when you deal with your bank, log out immediately. And banks tell you to do this. All those who have used online banking systems, they will always say, do your transaction, log out immediately. Don't hang around. Okay? They will also have automatic log out after a few minutes. But they will also tell you log out immediately to avoid any such problem. Okay? So you can do a few things to protect yourself. And there are other uh, hacks. So, uh, web so many websites say give comments. And they'll show the comment to other users. In that comment, you could put in this code. The website was not a cheating website. It simply took comments from users and showed it to other users. If they allowed this comment to be put in, they have just enabled cross-site scripting. So whenever a website takes user input and shows it to other users, which is very important that they do what is called sanitizing the input. What is sanitizing? Removing this kind of stuff. Okay, so um, this is this thing. Prevent your website from being used to launch uh, these attacks. So disallow HTML tags in text input provided by users. So there are functions which will detect and remove these tags. Use them. If, if you take input from the user which you show to other users, do that. And there are a few more tricks here. I don't have time, so go read it up later. I just wanted to um, tell you that these issues are there so that you're aware of it. If you build applications today, you have to be aware of SQL injection. You have to be aware of cross-site scripting. These are two things which are widely used by attackers today. Okay. So in the main workshop, I will actually be spending more time on indexing and uh, query processing. But for this workshop, because of condensation, I decided I will cover this in detail. I'm going to shrink indexing greatly. I'm sure many of you have already taught it and you know about it. So I'm just going to highlight a few points in there. And similarly in query processing, cover index. There's also a chapter on um, storage, including uh, file, uh, how, how data is stored in files and, um, and about disk storage itself, RAID and so on, and buffers. So I, I'm going to skip it here, uh, but I will cover it in the main course.